Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text which we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We have been looking at the call that God placed upon the life of Moses and how it very much parallels the call that God places upon our lives. Moses was called to be a servant of God. At the time of Moses' call, he didn't think very much of himself. He had left the glories of Egypt. He had become a wandering shepherd. He had been stumbling around in a dirty desert for 40 years. But God had plans for Moses. God has plans for you, likewise. You may look back over your life and it seems like a wasteland. But as the Spirit of God moves in your life, you suddenly realize that you are important to God. You suddenly realize that God has a plan for your life. You suddenly begin to understand that it is a plan that you cannot accomplish. That it will take divine enablement and divine power. But God is faithful to provide that and God will also give the direction every step of the way so that you might accomplish his plan and so that you might be pleasing to him. As we look back over the last several weeks of what we have learned in our study of Moses' call and his commission, we have arrived at ten different basic principles which applied to Moses and which also apply to the Christian life and to our call and commission by God. The first principle that we studied was that doing the will of God is the first key to the new job description that God has given to us when he calls us to salvation and to service. Not doing our own will anymore, not doing the will of whatever the flesh wants to do, but learning what it means to do the will of God. The second principle that we learned, and I made mention of that a moment ago, is that what God commands us to do, God always empowers us to do. We're going to spend some time on that a little bit later as we move into the empowerment that God has provided for us as believers. The third principle that we learned was that full obedience to the will of God, not merely knowing his will, but full obedience to the will of God is a sign of Christian maturity. If you have not yet reached the stage where you are seeking daily to fully obey the will of God, whereby you have carved out major sections of your life for yourself, you have not yet arrived at Christian maturity. Because full obedience to the will of God is a sign of Christian maturity. The fourth principle that we learn is that service and sacrifice, not sloth and selfishness, service and sacrifice are the visible proof of obedience to the will of God. You say, well, I am I'm fully in the center of God's will. Do you see in your life true service to him? We spent a great deal, two weeks of time talking about the different areas of service to which God has called the believer. Service and sacrifice, not sloth and selfishness, are the visible proof of obedience to the will of God. The fifth principle was a servant heart will characterize the believer because a servant heart is a reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talks about that in Philippians, and speaking of Christ, he says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's, that's the incarnation. That is God the Son coming down from heaven, entering humanity through the virgin birth, living on earth and walking among men, dying on the cross and bearing their sins, rising from the dead and ascending to heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, because he humbled himself, and became obedient unto that death, the Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You remember the principle that we learned then? The way up is down. The way up 
is down. Say it with me. The way up is down. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He had the servant heart, and that is the key to his exaltation. If you and I would be followers of Christ, a servant heart will characterize the believer because it is a reflection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The sixth principle, which had multiple parts to it, but the sixth principle that we learned was our external actions and what we love will reflect our desire to please Christ and not to cause a stumbling block to the brethren or produce an unholy testimony to a watching world. What people see in you will reflect what's inside you. We looked at multiple illustrations of this through scripture and saw that this includes our clothing, our music, our speech, our food and drink, our use of time, the yielding of our talents for the service of Christ, our focus on worldly possessions or on eternal possessions, our amassing and use of wealth that God entrusts to us, our response to authority, our care and provision for one another, the purity of our bodies, what we allow to enter into our minds through our five senses. We covered all of those things over multiple weeks, but that's a major principle when we look at the new job description that God has given to us in the body of Christ. Our external actions will also be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God and will reflect our desire to please Christ and not to cause a stumbling block to weaker brethren or cause an unholy testimony to a watching world. Principle number seven, our spiritual job of doing the will of God is based on divinely perceived needs that must be met. Not the humanistic do-gooder things that people perceive, but on the divinely perceived needs. That's what we call the biblical world view. Seeing things the way God sees them. Understanding what is most important from God's perspective, not merely from man's perspective. Principle number eight was our spiritual job requires participation in spiritual warfare for the defense of the faith. That's one of the things that most of us don't like to be involved in. We don't like the conflict. But you see, folks, the enemy is there. The enemy is vicious. The enemy is violent. The enemy is on the attack. Israel wants peace, but they can't have it because they are constantly under bombardment by enemy fire from the Gaza Strip, from the Lebanon previously from the Golan Heights, terrorist bombings of buses in the city of Jerusalem. Folks, you and I, whether we like it or not, are involved in a spiritual warfare. And we have been given the armor of faith in Ephesians chapter 6, the helmet of salvation. We have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We have the shield of faith. We have our loins girt about with truth. We have on the breastplate of righteousness. We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's described as armor to protect us from the wiles of the devil. We have only one offensive weapon in that entire list of armor in Ephesians 6. And that is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The defense of the faith requires us not merely to exercise reason and logic, but to know, to understand, and to be able to use the scriptures, which are the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. How well do you know the Word of God? That tells how well you know how to use your only weapon. The Word of God is quick and powerful, says the scripture, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you know the sword of the spirit? Do you know the word of God? If you have your Bible in your hands, you've got the full sword. If you have, say, perhaps just a New Testament, Pretend this is a New Testament. In your hands, you've got a dagger. If you've got it memorized, you've got your karate. The Word of God, that's what you and I need to have, and we need to have it so well integrated into our lives that the use of it becomes automatic as we move through life day by day, as we face temptation, as we face confrontation, as we face challenges to the scriptures, 
we know what the word says and we are well armed. Spiritual warfare in defense of the faith. Principle number nine that we learned was God most frequently uses humble people who recognize their own inadequacies. You don't have to have multiple doctorates to be able to be a faithful Christian. You, nearly, you merely need to walk with the Savior day by day. To humbly sit at his feet instead of telling him what you are going to do. To learn from him and learn to obey. God uses humble people. Here's Moses, middle of the wilderness. He's a humble person. He's let 40 years trample him down in the dirt. But now God picks him up and says, I have a job for you to do. And finally, when God calls and commands, God always gives clear evidence of his call. He gave that to Moses here in verse 12. This shall be a token unto thee. I'm going to give you some evidence. I'm going to give you a demonstration. You're going to have to obey me first, but you're going to get a demonstration of it. Because when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Exodus 3.12. For us, God has also given evidence that he has called us. For us, God has also given us evidence that he has commissioned us and sent us and commanded us as to what we should do. And the evidence that God has given to us is the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit of God and the spiritual gifts which he entrusts to you at the moment of salvation. Jesus promised it in John 14. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, now listen to this last phrase, and shall be in you. That's the promise of Jesus Christ himself. That's what we see beginning to blossom and flourish on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That's what we find the Apostle Paul talking about in the doctrinal epistles as he explains it to the Romans, as he explains it to the Ephesians, as he explains it to the Colossians, as he explains the fruit of the Spirit to the Galatians who are being led astray into, into all kinds of Judaism and legalisms and strange doctrines contrary to the faith all over the New Testament, the now new empowerment of the holy, notice that word holy, the Holy Spirit never motivates that which is unholy, the Holy Spirit of God who shall be in you. And that's what brings us to our study for today. You have received at the moment of salvation not only the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, but at that moment you also received certain what are called spiritual gifts in the New Testament. There are two different kinds of spiritual gifts. There are temporary sign gifts, and we'll explain why they're called sign gifts in a moment, but these were gifts that were only giving, given during the lifetime of the Apostles. These are gifts that are being counterfeited today, but they are no longer being given by the Spirit of God. And then there are what are called the permanent service gifts. Those are gifts that are still being given today, and at the moment of your salvation, you received one or more of those gifts. You might not yet have been able to use those gifts because you had not yet been prepared for their use, but the gift was given to you. For example... I was saved at age three. At age three, I understood that I was a rotten sinner, that I was headed for hell, that I was lost. Only God can convict the heart of a three-year-old to understand that, but I understood it clearly. I understood I was lost. I understood that if I died, I would go to hell. I had heard the faithful preaching of my father. Oh, how I thank God for that man. A faithful man, a bold man, a man studied in the scripture. 
I had heard the gentle testimony of my mother, and I knew that without Christ, as my personal Savior, I was lost. And so I came in one day to my mom and said, Mama, I want to trust Jesus. And she went me through the gospel, explained very carefully once again so that I would truly understand that Jesus Christ was both God and man, that he died for my sins in my place on Calvary's cross bearing my sins, that he really died and was buried and that he rose again. And if I would trust that Jesus, he would save me. So I knelt next to my mama as she sat on the bed. And I prayed. And asked the Lord Jesus to forgive my sins. And to give me, as he promised, eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. And I know without question of a doubt that at that very moment... I was saved. I had entered the kingdom of light out of the kingdom of darkness. I had been transformed from death into life. I had been given an eternal hope that would never perish. Folks, if you've never done that, you are lost. It's not enough to be a church member. It's not enough to be baptized. It's not enough to be confirmed. It's not enough to do good deeds. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins. If you could get to heaven any other way, Jesus would never have had to die on Calvary's cross. Remember that. When you think you can get to heaven some other way, what you are doing is despising the gift of God's Son and saying that it is irrelevant to you. Spiritual gifts. And so one of the great things that God has given to us is his spirit, but also he has given to us gifts that we might serve. A definition of spiritual gifts is their divine enablements, sovereignly given to individual believers to edify, that is to build up the church. The believers themselves are God's gifts to the church, and thus the gifts are not designed for selfish use. When we're given the gift, we may not yet be able to use them, as in the illustration I just gave. I was saved at three and given the gift of pastor-teacher at three, but I could not yet use it, for I was not yet prepared. God had gifted Moses in many different ways. Moses was clearly leadership material. But he had to go through some hard knocks before he finally was useful and usable by God. Only as God took me through the process and prepared me for being a pastor-teacher was I then able to exercise that gift. I knew very early on that God had called me to preach. In fact, at the time that I was saved, my dad was still in a music ministry. He was not yet a pastor, but he was a faithful preacher of the word. Every opportunity that he got but I knew God had called me to preach. I never lost that conviction all the way through elementary school, all the way through junior high, all the way through high school, all the way through college, all the way through seminary, all the way through graduate school. I never lost that conviction that God had called me to preach. It was a gift that God confirmed, a gift that God has empowered, a gift that God has used for the edification of the body of Christ. The early church, before the written New Testament was completed, had what we called the seven sign gifts. We're going to talk about each of those briefly in a few moments, but to list them, they include the gift of apostle, the gift of prophet, the gift of healings, the gift of miracles, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, and the gift of of knowledge. Last week we read the passage in Acts chapter 2 concerning the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. As you know, the Jewish feasts that God ordained in the Old Testament each had a typological significance. 
For example, the New Testament tells us that Passover was fulfilled by the death of Christ on the cross. First fruits, we are told by the New Testament, was fulfilled by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. The Feast of Weeks, which is also called the Feast of Pentecost, was fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were with us last Sunday evening, you know we talked in detail about the work of the Holy Spirit and what he does. But when we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, that does not mean that he was not present prior to Acts 2. The Holy Spirit is also God, and therefore he is always omnipresent. But just like the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is also God, and therefore he was always present prior to the Incarnation. But at the Incarnation, he came to perform specific works prophesied in the Old Testament. In the same way, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, as also prophesied in the Old Testament, in Joel chapter 2, to fulfill the prophecy concerning the new work that he would do, what was prophesied by Jesus, that he would indwell us and permanently indwell us, and then empower us for the divine call and commands that God places upon our lives. The principle is the same as the call and the divine commands that God gave to Moses, but the specific job responsibilities are different. At the outset, in the days of Moses and at the beginning of the New Testament church, both, there were certain miracles that accompanied the call and the command. For example, Moses had certain supernatural signs that were not given to anyone else. Joshua never got these signs. Miriam didn't get these signs. Uh, Aaron didn't get these signs. None of the leaders of Israel ever got these signs. They were only for Moses. For example, the hand that became leprous and then returned to normal. When he inserted it into his bosom, pulled it out, it became leprous. When he inserted it again, it became clean as the other hand. Or the serpent which came out of his snake. He took his, uh, uh, the serpent that came out of his rod, rather, he took his rod and cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. He picked it up and it turned back into his rod again. Those signs were not given to anyone else. The ten plagues, for example, we don't find those reoccurring. The crossing of the Red Sea. These were miracles and signs that were given to Moses to demonstrate his authority and his call. In the same way, during the apostolic period, the apostles were given certain signs to demonstrate their authority, to demonstrate that the message that they had was the true message of God, to demonstrate their call to begin the New Testament church. Later, Joshua didn't have the same miraculous signs that Moses did. In the New Testament, the apostles had the seven sign gifts, but after the death of the apostles, the sign gifts were removed by the Holy Spirit. Joshua experienced certain miraculous answers to prayer. The fall of the walls of Jericho, the time when the sun stood still so that he could have a complete military victory, but he did not have the same sign gifts that Moses had. He did, however, have some divinely given leadership and service gifts for serving God's people. And we discover that even so today there are service gifts for serving God's people. In the same way as with the passing of the miraculous apostolic sign gifts, the service gifts remain. So let's talk for a moment about the temporary sign gifts so that we'll understand what they are, so that we'll understand what was their purpose, and so that we will understand why the Holy Spirit is no longer giving them. That will, I hope, enable us to more clearly see why the so-called charismatic manifestations that are present in certain groups of people today are in fact counterfeits. The seven temporary sign gifts listed as such in the New Testament are the gifts of apostle, the gift of prophet, the gift of healings, and it's in the plural, very interesting in the Greek, the gift of miracles, which is distinct from healings, as we'll see, the gift of tongues, which could be translated languages, the gift of interpretation of tongues, which could also be translation of languages, and the gift of knowledge. What was the gift of apostle? Apostles were men, not women, there are no women apostles, who had seen and been taught 
by the resurrected Christ, had all of the other spiritual gifts, and were given to establish the church at its inception. Rather interesting as we look at the gift of apostle, because the gift of apostle, we discover those who were apostles actually had all of the other gifts as well. They were sort of multitask persons, if you will. People who were able to do all the different things that we find any of the spiritual gifts doing. The meaning of an apostle, apostello, is one who sent forth. The question is, who sent them, and for what purpose were they sent? Because we find not only the apostles of Christ, the ones sent forth by Christ, but we find later on those who are called apostles of the churches, whom we would call today missionaries, those who were sent forth to carry the scriptures to other people who had not heard. In the Gospels, the word apostle is only used of the twelve, it is used in the church age only of the eleven, that is, minus Judas, of Paul, and of Matthias. We find, after the death of the apostles, no others were appointed to fulfill the role of apostle. This is contrary to certain organizations which believe they have a continuing apostolic authority. The problem with that is there are multiple groups that claim this, some large, some small, but all contradict one another. And so, who is right? Well, the scripture is right. No one, according to scripture, was ever commissioned past the death of the apostles. And the scripture makes that clear to us. The purpose was to found the church. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 312, and chapter 4, verses 4 through 16 makes that very clear. Their abilities, they had all of the spiritual gifts. The temporal requirements were they must have seen and been taught by the resurrected Christ. And of course, after the ascension, that cannot take place again until the rapture of the church. No one today is seeing the resurrected Christ physically with his eyes and being taught by him. There are demonic manifestations that claim to be Christ. And Paul talks about those in the opening verses of the book of Galatians. He talks about those over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Satan appears as an angel of light. It's no strange thing if his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. Yes, Satan still counterfeits, and he pretends on occasion to be Jesus. He pretends on occasion to be an angel of light. He pretends on occasion to be giving new special revelation that has never been given by God before. But in every case, it is a deception and contrary to Scripture. Your final touchstone, friends, is the Word of God. If it does not speak according to the law and to the testimony, it is because there is no light in them, says the prophet. The word of God is the final authority. Thy word is truth, Jesus said, John 17, 17. The scripture is the final authority. And the requirements for an apostle was that he must have been one who was, had seen and been taught of the resurrected Christ. That is stated specifically in Acts chapter 2 at the choosing of Matthias. You cannot be an apostle without that. The cults who claim apostles fit the category of false apostles. There was a transitional period. There was the lifespan of the apostles, the end of the signed gifts, and the end of the reception of new special revelation as we move through that transition, which is described for us in the book of Acts. Jewish males in Acts chapter 2. We find those who are male and female, half Jew, half Gentile in Acts chapter 8. We find one who is neither Jewish nor Gentile because he's... Gentile by birth and Jewish by religion, and he's neither male nor female, he's a eunuch in Acts chapter 8 being brought in. We find those who are 100% Gentiles, Roman oppressors being brought into the body of Christ in Acts chapter 10. We find Acts chapter 16, we find a female head of the household, and in Acts chapter 16 also that's Lydia, and in Acts chapter 16 also we find the Philippian jailer, a male head of a household, and his entire family is saved. Folks, you're, you're seeing an expansion of the gospel as you move through the book of Acts, and then you have the completion of the New Testament canon of Scripture, and new special revelation ceases at that point. And thus, the need for the gift of apostle ceases. The gift of prophet, the second of those in the temporary gifts, is similar but not identical with Old Testament prophecy. We discover in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter, that it is related to tongues, and in the other places where tongues appears, we find the gift of prophecy. Both of those gifts deal with the reception and the proclamation of new, special revelation from God. 
In the case of prophecy, it's in the language of the one speaking. In the case of the gift of tongues or languages, it is in the language of the hearers. You never find tongues, by the way, referring to any kind of gibberish, which goes on in many charismatic churches today. The gift of tongues is a gift of a known human language, where it first appears in Acts chapter 2, 18 specific languages are mentioned. Nobody was babbling unintelligible gibberish. They were speaking unlearned, known human languages. It was unbelievers to whom it was given for a sign, not to believers. There are those today who say that this is the proof that you have this Holy Spirit and they get you down at the front of the church and they babble over you and push their hands down on top of you until you start babbling too. No, no, it was never a sign for believers. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It was a sign for unbelievers who would hear the gospel proclaimed in their own human language. Once the scriptures are finished, once they have been completed, that gift is no longer being given by the Holy Spirit. There are counterfeits of it, but the gift of the Spirit is no longer there. So the gift of prophet. Uh, we find that the purpose of all biblical prophecy is to reveal the person and work of Christ to and among and for his elect. You look at the Old Testament prophets. They foreshadowed and preached Christ. Jesus says so in Luke chapter 24. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All of the Old Testament has as its ultimate focus, whether we are dealing with direct prophecy, whether we are dealing with typology, whether we are dealing with the control by God of the course of history, it all focuses in on Jesus Christ, on the promised coming Messiah. The Holy Spirit, who directed the inspiration of Scripture, does not speak of himself. He never points to himself. He never makes himself the most important one to be focused on. He always points to Christ. Which also tells you when a particular group of people begin to focus solely on the Holy Spirit and on the gifts of the Spirit, which they think are gifts of the Spirit, they are soon losing focus that the Spirit brings on Christ. When we study the spiritual gifts, it is not so that we can have ecstatic experiences. It is so that we might understand how he, through the scriptures and through the work of illumination that is causing our understanding of the scriptures, always draws us back to Christ. That is often forgotten in modern day circles. The gift of healings. It's very important to remember that healers do not alone control God's healing of the body. The Apostle Paul had the gift of healing. But he talks about Trophimus. Trophimus have I left at Miletus because he was sick. Epaphroditus, he was sick nigh unto death. And Paul praises the Lord that finally Epaphroditus got well, but Paul couldn't heal him. There are instances where the gift of healing is not used or cannot be used in the New Testament by even people who had the gift because it does not fit the purpose for the gift, which was to authenticate the message of the apostles. And when it did not fit that purpose, it could not be used. It's also important to remember that not all sickness as some of the charismatic movement claim today, is from Satan. Some sickness is merely because you and I, as descendants of Adam and Eve, are subject to the curse. Miracles. Miracles are similar, but not identical to Old Testament miracles, and in fact they are distinct from the healings that occur in the New Testament. For example, Elymas the sorcerer. Elymas the sorcerer had withstood the Apostle Paul. And finally the Apostle Paul, in anger, turns to him and says, Oh, you son of wickedness, you know, you're going to be blind for a season. You're going to wander around having somebody lead you by the hand and whack. God smites him with blindness. That's a miracle, folks. That's not a healing. So the gift of healings and the gift of miracles are not identical. The terms that are used for miracles are wonders, 
signs, powers, works. Wonders are something strange causing the beholder to marvel. Signs indicate that the mere presence of God is there and the working of God. Powers indicates God doing what man cannot in his own physical strength do. Works indicates that these are things that are ordinary for Christ because it talks about his mighty works. As we look at the New Testament gifts, we find similarities to the Old Testament gifts, but there is a difference. We find in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon certain people at certain times to empower them, but then he left. We find that Saul, coming for David, almost reaches the place when suddenly he is struck down, removes his cloak, and begins to roll on the ground under the power of the Spirit of God. And so the question was, has Saul become a prophet? Is Saul also among the prophets? God was stopping him at that very moment from reaching David, from committing the murder that he had in his heart. So it was not necessarily what we would call a blessing in terms of a spiritual gift. We find the Spirit came upon Saul and the Spirit departed from Saul. But when we get to the New Testament, we discover that the gifts and the calling of God, as Paul tells us in Romans 12, are without repentance. When God gives you a specific spiritual gift, he will not take it back from you. And the new work of the Spirit is now he permanently indwells us. He does not merely come upon us temporarily so that we might do something exciting but he now permanently indwells us. Our bodies, as Paul explains to us, are now, when we've trusted Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he also explains that if you defile God's temple, God will destroy you for doing so. That's the reason for the call to purity in the Christian life, is because you as a believer now have resident inside you the Holy Spirit of God. How important these things are. Healings and miracles and then tongues. When we get to the gift of tongues, there is so much to say about that, and our time is almost gone. We have two minutes, so I'll only give you a brief overview, because I want to cover the sign gifts this week and the service gifts next week. That'll be even more difficult. Seven sign gifts, 15 service gifts. But tongues, that's the one everybody wants to ask about. All the passages in the entire Bible that deal with it are Mark 16, 17, Acts 2, uh, Acts 10, Acts 19, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, and uh, uh, chapter 14 also of 1 Corinthians, and Isaiah chapter 28 where it's mentioned in verse 11. There are no illustrations of Old Testament saints ever having the gift of tongues. There are no illustrations of saints in the Gospels having the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues, as I said before, was a sign we find it is a sign to unbelievers and a sign to the Jews because the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom as Paul explains. We are clearly told that tongues would cease, 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It's not a question of will they cease. It's merely a question of when did they cease. There is no passage in the New Testament admonishing believers to seek the gift of tongues, although you will find that in the charismatic movement. There were specific regulations concerning tongues when it was a gift that was being given. There could never be more than three speakers. You never find that in any charismatic churches. They could only speak one at a time. That is never the case in charismatic churches. It always was men, never women. There never could be speaking in tongues unless there was someone who could translate the foreign language. It was always under the control of the man who had the gift, as was the gift of prophecy. It was not an ecstatic babbling that he could not control. The gift of tongues, according to Bible definition, was the gift of speaking a foreign language understood by others, but one not previously known to the speaker who had never studied it. The things that you see today that so-called pass for tongues were also manifest in heathenism before Pentecost. As a matter of fact, very interesting. Tongues was manifest 
among the heathen during the Boxer Rebellion in China in 1900, where thousands of Christians were killed by the tongue-speaking heathen. Tongues is manifested in Indonesia. I've seen video footage of this. One of my best friends in high school was from Jakarta, Indonesia, and his sponsor here in the United States had traveled over, gone to the island of Bali, and gone to some of the worship services of the pagans there who believed that years ago their ancestor uh, fought with the, uh, one of the pagan gods and the monkey king helped out and fought with the pagan god and got back this hero's bride who had been stolen by the pagan god. And as they go through the ceremony, they um, have people dancing around with these big, huge, ugly masks on and sword fighting. And as it reaches the climax of the ceremony, they stab each other through, but no blood comes out. And finally, the entire audience begins to babble in tongues, speaking like monkeys. Folks, there are pagan phenomena under the control of Satan and under the control of human emotions that are not what the Holy Spirit gave on the day of Pentecost, which was speaking a known human language that had never been studied by those speaking it. And the message of the tongue's speakers was pointing to Christ, fulfilling prophecy, Christ being the Savior. That's not the case in these other things. All kinds of weird stuff goes on under the name of so-called Christianity. There are only two sources for the so-called present-day gift of tongues, Satan and his evil spirits, or man and his deceived spirit. Interpretation of tongues, very briefly, is the ability to translate that without ever having learned the language. And I wish we had more time to spend on that, but I must pass over it immediately. The gift of knowledge is the last of the temporary gifts. It doesn't mean that knowledge has ceased in terms of what has been accumulated by man and written down in encyclopedias. The gift of knowledge was the gift whereby God gave direct, new, special revelation to men so that, therefore, the gift of apostle, prophet, and finally the inscripturation, the writing down of that new revelation in what we have today as the word of God, could be completed. That gift is no longer being given. God has given us his final authority. God has given us his word. The gift of knowledge ceased. God turned it off when he ceased giving the gift of tongues. When he ceased giving new revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8. Well, the Lord willing, we'll sometime have opportunity to cover the rest of those things. But the point of our lesson today is that our new job description includes the exercise of our service gifts. Not the temporary sign gifts, but the exercise of our service gifts. The exercise of the gifts that are still available for believers today to minister one to another. That includes the gift of evangelist, the gift of pastor-teacher, the gift of teacher, the gift of governments, the gift of ruling, the gift of helps, the gift of faith, the gift of wisdom, the gift of self-control, the gift of discerning of spirits, which has nothing to do with telling who's demon-possessed. It has to deal with applying the scripture to test true and false doctrine. The gift of giving, the gift of ministration, the gift of exhortation, the gift of mercy, and the gift of hospitality. Those things are all called spiritual gifts in the New Testament. And every one of you who have placed your faith in Jesus Christ have one or more of those gifts so that you might serve Christ, so that you might serve his body, so that you might be a testimony to the world around us of what it means to be a Christian whereby we can show our love for Christ by our love one for another. Well, the Lord willing, that's where we'll pick up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its precision. We've had to move very quickly this morning, but we pray that it has been in such a way that we might understand some of the things that are our responsibilities as we have been called to serve you, even as Moses was called to serve you. And you never place a call on us, never give us a commission, never give us commands, unless you also empower us to fulfill those commands. You called and commissioned Moses and you empowered him and gave him clear evidences to demonstrate your call as you sent him to serve you in Egypt and calling the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
In the same way you have called us, commissioned us, and commanded us to serve you. And you have likewise given us the necessary empowerment so that we might do so. We thank you, Father, for your indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank you for your finished and final word, that which we must carry to those who have never heard. We thank you, Father, for the gifts that you have given to us by your Spirit, that we might minister in the body of Christ, that we might edify one another, that we might encourage, that we might warn, that we might comfort, that we might help, that we might demonstrate mercy to, that we might give, that we might walk by faith, that we might live the lives that are possible only as you empower us, lives that are never possible to live in the mere power of the flesh. And so, Father, we pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth this day, that you will use it in the hearts and lives of each one of us, so that we would be truly mature Christians, serving you with all of our hearts and soul and strength and mind, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.